so I, I got into this, this, this message, and I told you, I, I'm going to save the last point for next week. And uh, I, I started into this story about this guy. And, and I, want, I want you to turn in your Bibles now as we look at Acts chapter 3 again. And, and I know we've had an action-packed service. We've had a lot of things that we didn't do. But I'll tell you, I loved hearing those testimonies. The Bible says, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Let them that have been touched by God and the power of God stand up and say so. And uh, when we were scheduling the kids' choir, and they said, man, what would be a good Sunday to have them? And I said, I'll tell you what, after we talk about our bus ministry and the impact, have these kids come out here and, and sing about their relationship with God is awesome. But uh, we've gone through and we talked about the difference. And I, I just want you to see that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. And I, from the very beginning, I've been preaching and teaching, get out, do something, go for God, make a difference, send people through our money around the world, or get into our bus ministry, go down the Broad Street Mission, just realize there is great joy in doing the work of God. Too many people have this idea that church is a Sunday thing, and church is somewhere where you go. And in our Christianity 101 class, we were talking about the church, and I said, man, the church should be the place. Sunday morning should be the huddle. This is where we come together on Sunday morning and say, let's go, one, two, three, go. And then we get out, and we stand out, and we run in the world to do the job. But some people think the huddle is the whole thing. Man, great, we need the huddle, but it's what we do when we break out of the huddle to go into the world to make the difference. And I, I brought you to these guys, Peter and John. They had this great revival. People's lives were changed. They go into the city. They're going to go into the temple to pray. There's this lame man. He's laying right there. And they're walking in the city. And, and this guy's crying out. And they stop. And, and, and Peter and John walk up to him. And they're like, man. And the Bible says that they fixed their eyes on him. They, they, they looked at different eyes, realizing this guy could have what we have could have a changed life if we just pay attention to them. Every single day, every single person passes that lame guy that's either crippled by regret. Just, just go down the list of what these kids were. Crippled by being called stupid their whole life. Crippled by being called that they're worthless. Be, crippled by being called that they're, that they're uh, not worth it. All, all these different scars that they have, every person there, that they, they resemble that person that's laying on that lame man. They cannot get up. They're waiting for somebody to go to them. Nobody goes to them. How will they ever know? And it wasn't good enough that the fact that they had this great revival and the revival speaker, Peter, was walking in the town. That guy did not ask and say, give me a touch of your revival. He just said, do you have any bread? Do you have anything that's going to get me through the day? Say, so what made the difference of these two guys? They believed. Man, if, if you don't believe in what we do, if you don't believe in the testimonies that change your life, if you don't believe in that cross, you will never open your lips to say anything. You know why I'm excited about what we do? Because I believe in the cross. I believe... In the word of God, I believe that this is the word of God. I believe that it has the power to change lives. I believe that God did send his son. He died on the cross. He died and rose again three days later. I believe that with all my heart. When you believe something, it's going to change what you do with it. If I ran in here and said, hey, the building's on fire, and you thought, oh, he's full of it, he's, he lies too much, and all that, you're just going to sit there there. But if you had confidence in what I said, and I ran in here and said, the building's on fire, you guys are going to get up and run out. You know why? Because you believe in what I have to say. You're, you're not going to do anything with what you have unless you believe in what you have. They believed in it. They talked about how it changed their life and all that God did through them. In Acts chapter 3, verse 12, And when Peter saw it, he answered unto the people, Ye men of Israel, why marvel at this? And why you look so earnestly on us, as though by your own power or holiness we have made this man to walk? He's saying, guys, it's not of us. Man, you, you heard the stories, you saw the kids, you heard the music and everything, but I'm telling you, all that you saw today has nothing to do with us and everything to do with our God. Everything to do with our God. These guys are like, man, I'm glad you think that's awesome. But let me tell you, I'm only saved in difference because of the power of God. 
Every redemption story in here today is a story of the power of God. Of how God is able. Verse 13, and when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant, they marveled and took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. Now when they saw the boldness, see your belief goes from your belief to your boldness. You will have the the. the the, the heart to stand up and open your lips. You're going to have the heart to be able to knock on that door or reach into that community or say something to them when, you're, when, when your belief has changed your effort. Man, it made a difference. But then I want to get into our point today. They went from their belief to the fact that they were bold to let me wrap it up to the fact that they were blessed. Acts chapter 3 We see that Peter said, silver and gold have I none. But such as I have give I thee in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. In verse 7, and they took him by the right hand and lifted him up. And immediately his feet and his ankle bones received strength. And we get to verse 8. And you say, what is so special about this? Why do you do what you do? And a lot of us, well, I better witness because that's what we're supposed to do as Christians. You know, it's our duty, it's our job, I better witness, I better pass out an Easter invite, I better do this, I better, man, I'm telling you right now, you have missed it. You have no idea of the joy and the blessing of knowing that you are having an impact and changing somebody's life. That layman, so here's what happens, it's like, dude, they reached down, they picked him up, and he's like, man, this is a lot better. All right, guys. Have a, have a good day, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go over here and I'm going to, you know, go check out my friends and run home and, no. And leaping, he stood up and walked and with them into the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. You know what they did? They not only did the work of God, they gained a brother on that day. Let let me ask you guys a question. How many people are sitting with you here today because you brought them here? How many people, their life has changed, and they were brought into the joy of the Lord. Man, this guy was not just happy. The Bible says leaping up, shouting, and praising God is what the Bible says. Walking, leaping, and praising God. Would you say this dude was just a little bit excited? I, 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 mean, I, I was, I was going to act this out. I'm not going to act it out. But I, I'm guarantee you this wasn't, oh, we... We're going to church. Man, how long do they preach for? I, I don't know, but hopefully it won't be long. Oh, man, I, I, I'm not getting that impression whatsoever from this guy. He found something that was worth living for. He found something that was worth getting excited about. Now, some of us, if we were to see this guy in church today, we'd be like, man, that guy's just weird. Now, if he was at a Buckeye game, you wouldn't think he was weird. Be like, oh, that's typically, yeah, that's normal for people to, you know, paint their face and shout and scream and hold up big fuzzy fingers. And, you know, it's like, well, of course, Pastor Tony, he's got something. He's, it's the Buckeyes. No, I'm talking about leaving and praising God for my Savior. My Lord and Savior that has saved me from hell. So when you get excited in church, I'm here to tell you, it's okay. <laughs> we have something to get excited about. Sometimes we walk in here like there's a casket at the front. It's like, oh, we need to show reference. I'm here to worship my Lord and Savior that has changed my life. This guy went leaping and dancing and jumping up and praising God because God did something in his life. And he had something to get excited about. There is joy in being part of God's work. Now here he is going in there. And Peter Peter and John are standing back going, dude, that guy's more excited than we are. They had to catch up with the lame man. This guy's running ahead. Man, let's go in the temple with this guy. So the, he runs into the temple. And I'm reading through this story and thinking, man, this is exciting. It's exciting being part of the God's word. There should be a joy and a happiness that comes over realizing that it's not just the work of God. It's the work of God. It's people changing lives Filling pews, singing, singing people that are, are, are in choirs and lifting up their hands, change lives. That's what the ministry is all about. But that's not my message, though. And they entered together in the temple. In verse 9, and all the people saw him walking and praising God. 
because he was so discreet about it. <laughs> he was so quiet. That's how he was worshiping that day. Hand to the side, lips, you know, head and the perfect. That's how he was praising God. And nobody, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> and all the people saw him walking and praising God, and they knew that it was he which sat with alms at the, uh, uh, at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were all filled with wonder and amazement at that which had happened unto him. They sit back and go, wait a minute. How is that possible that that guy used to be a drunk and now he's praising God? How is that possible that that guy used to be an alcoholic and that guy used to beat his wife and that guy used to have a broken marriage? And how is it possible that that guy went from there to being up there praising God? How is that possible? There's something that ought to happen in our community where people see changed lives and they wonder what's going on. These people are scratching their heads going, wow, this is not normal. They're intrigued. They're curious. They're wondering, what happened to this guy? And the layman, which was healed, uh, healed, held Peter and John, and all the people ran together unto them into the porch and called Solomon's porch, greatly wondering. They stirred them up. They, they, they were curious. They were trying to figure out what happened. So this bothered them so bad that I, I don't know if you guys realize the rest of the story. They actually go back and arrest Peter and John, throw them in prison overnight, come out the next day and say, guys, you can't do this anymore. Your church is getting so excited that it's stirring people up, wondering, people are wondering if you guys found something better than our, our false gods and our idols. The world ought to see something different than God's people. That they ought to be able to look at us and know that we found something greater than what's going on in this dead world. I said, you know what, we're, gonna, we're just going to make this simple. If you guys would just be quiet and go your separate ways. Man, if you, if you guys would just tone down this excitement and just get out of here. And they pulled off to the side, and I know I'm skipping over this part. They pulled them off to the side, and they said, guys, we've got to do something about this. They said, what are you talking about? They said, we've got a problem. That guy has a genuine changed life. That guy was, was lame for 40 years and now he's not lame anymore. We can't argue with the change in his life. We have a problem here. So they went back and they said, all we can do is beg of them to be quiet about what God has done. And then we come to Acts 4 verse 20. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. We can't hold back what God has done. And they let him go because they could not do anything to stop the work of God. In verse 23, and being let go, they went to their own company, which is the church. And they reported all that the chief priests and the elders had said unto them. And when they had heard that, they lifted up their voices to God with one accord and said, Lord... Thou art God, which has made heaven and earth and the sea and all that, um, and that in them is. Why in the world? And you step back and say, what is going on here? here? Here's what happens. They are in this spot. God showed up. God blessed. God healed. They stood up and praising God. God took what they did in the world, brought it in the church. And the Bible says right here, they all stood up and was praising God. You know why we came here today? We're not here just to say, go out and do it. We're here to embrace the blessings of what God has done. And God wants to continue to do. God's not finished working in lives like we saw on the screen today. We are, we are like 20 days, 21 days away from Easter Sunday. Do you realize that right now, that this, the church is pretty much full this morning, not even counting the fact that we have about 75 up in the balcony right now. You say, man, that's great. No, to God be the glory because every person here represents a soul that needs Jesus or a soul that has Jesus. But there's lots more that don't have what we have. There are so many more people that need a touch of God and need a touch of God's work and a touch of God's people. You have what they need. You're going to be like, oh, wait, wait a minute. You say, silver and gold have, uh, have I not, just like Peter and, Paul, uh, or Peter and John were saying this day, but such as you have give to them. You have the hope that can change their life. So they go back and they bow their head and they pray. And let me show you how God blessed. Number one, God blessed them with the presence of God. In Acts chapter 4 verse 
31, and when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together and, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. And they spake the word of God with boldness. In a world that is absent from God, in a world that has turned their back on God, I I desire to be in a place where the presence of God is dwelling. You see, God God didn't have to shake the place. And and, and, I mean, how incredible would it be to be in an actual place where God reached out and just took that church building for just a minute and just shook it. I looked it up, I was trying to think, it was an emotional thing stirring and whatever it is. God just did something to say, I am with you here. God shook them up to let them know that the presence of God was with them. And the presence of God is still with us as a church. When God's people are willing to do the work, stand for what they believe, have boldness to go, God turns around and God blesses his people. I'm not going to deny the fact that we need to have boldness and go. But I don't want to overlook the fact that God blesses in return. When we do the work of God, God shows up with his presence with God's people. God is with us with what we do. Too many times we do things without the touch of God and the presence of God. We go through the motions, but I'm telling you, Easter Sunday will be just another Sunday without the touch of God. When we pray and say, God, we want to be blessed with your power. We want to be blessed with your presence. I want to feel the touch of God where God shakes up lives and God shakes up our choir and God shakes up our congregation. God stirs in such a way that only God could do. No man could go up and shake that building, but on that day, God showed his presence and said, I am with you. What a blessing. Not only did they have the presence of God, but God blessed them with great unity. In verse 32 of chapter 4, And the multitude of them that believed were one heart and of one soul. Neither said any of them that ought of the things which he possessed was his own, but they had all things in common. God blessed them in the middle of that world that had all that persecution. God assembled them to a room where they had one heart and one soul. They were together. You know, let me describe it like this. They were a family Every one of those people that were on there said, one time I was in this community. I never knew what it was like to step foot in church until somebody brought me in. There's so many more people that don't experience what we have. Because let me tell you, it is a blessing to have the unity of God's people. It's a blessing to be able to stand up in one accord, be able to sing the song, "'Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus and how great thou art and what what a mighty God we serve." It is a blessing to have what we have going on right now as a body of believers. And sometimes I think we come in here and we embrace it, but we forget the blessing of what we have. What you have is a church family. A lot of people would die and love to have what we have. We are blessed with what we have right here. Sometimes we don't recognize those as God's blessing. They did the work, and when they gathered back together, God put upon him his blessing of his power, God put upon him the blessing of the unity is the fact that they could work together. The day that we can't work together as a church is the day that God says that I can't work with you or put my power on you. The day that we start arguing and start having strife and start thinking that we're better than other people or it has to be my way or my way or my way is the day that God says that I will not bless that. They had the presence of God. They had the unity of one another. God blessed them also with an outpouring of grace and power. Say, man, you just made that up just to sound cool with your point. Verse 33, and with great power gave the apostle witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And great grace was upon them all. Let me start with the great power. That word power right there is the same power that we started with two weeks ago. That dunamis power, that, that explosive power. That force that only God could give. That force that raised up Jesus from the dead is the same power. But this time we have another word. The Bible says that God gave them great power of the witness. I'm going to ask you guys right now. How many of you, by raising your hand right now with all boldness, would say that I have somebody that I know that I am burdened about the reach with God's power? Will you raise your hand? That's most of us, or if not all of us that are here today. Just yesterday, I I ran into two people that I went out of my way to to, to give them a track and invite them to our church. Let me tell you, we have the power to see God work in their lives. We have it. And if we don't believe that, God said that when they were willing to step out, God gave them great 
power to be witnesses of his resurrection. I promise you this. On Easter Sunday, we will go beyond out of our way with all of our heart and soul to deliver the straightforward gospel on that day. But it will not make a difference if those that need it are not here. Do you get that? You can say all day long, I know people that are dying and going to hell. I know people that need the touch of God. I know people that have broken marriage. I know my neighbors that have never set foot in church. I have family members. It does not matter unless we expose them to the great power that God has. Raising our hands is not enough to heal a broken world. And I know that we all have different talents and abilities, but I'm telling you one thing that God has given us all is the power to go out and tell others when we claim the power of God. But he said not only of a great power, but God blessed them. God gave to them. God poured out upon them. He says great grace. The thing is God's goodness. And he said, what was that grace? It was unmerited favor. But the Bible says that God gave them, poured out on them that day, uh, unmentioned, but great grace on that day. You know what that is? That's just the blessings of God that you just use your mind to imagine what that is. Let me, let me just testify for just a minute and tell you what, I, what I'm asking the great grace to be. That this little girl that stood right here grows up to one day sing in that choir or sing on this praise team or go out in this world. I, I, want, I want the blessings of God upon my life and I'm not saying a big house or a fancy car. I'm just saying I want the outpouring of God to give me grace to do what I cannot do. Grace is you receiving something from God that you never deserved. I never deserved to have such a beautiful wife that could stand up here and sing. I never deserved to have my son that got up with me this morning that ran up to set up junior church and my other son that's working in class right now and my daughter that's standing in the same. You know what all those things are? Those are the blessings of God. And nobody in this world could ever give me those blessings. Only God can give them. But the Bible says that on that day when they prayed, when they met in one accord, when they had the the presence of God, God poured out on them God's grace. God gave them what they could never give themselves. I'll tell you what, that's pretty cool. I'm just telling you right now, just, just for me every week, preach, go out, tell, do the work of God, witness, get on the bus routes, go down the broad street, and we're saying, okay, I need to do that. I'm leaving out the part, man, when you cross into that, you better open up your arms because God's going to load you with blessings. That, that's not my motive. I'm not, I'm, I'm not serving God to get a hookup. It, it, it's not, Lord, I did that for you, you know, like kind of, you know, lace my fingers now and, and hook me up. It's a matter of I do it because I love him, but he, he does back to me because he loves me too. Uh, sometimes we leave that f- fact out of it, that there, there's great blessings that come from living in the presence of God and serving God. Here's the last one. I don't want you to read into this, but I'm just going to give you the flat out scripture of what it says. And on this day, when they came back and they're praising God for what they have done of reaching people in the community... Verse 34, neither was there any among them that lacked. For as many as were possessors of the land or houses sold them and brought the prices of their things that were sold and laid them down at the apostles' feet and distribution was made unto every man according to as he had need. I'm not trying to preach a health, wealth, and prosperity gospel. I'm not trying to tell you right now that you get out, you do something for God, and God's going to buy you a Lexus tomorrow. God's going to load your mailbox with, you know, checks from random people and all these other things that they do. But I'm just going to tell you this. God always, always takes care of the work of God. Always. It doesn't, last week, some of you missed it, we had our business meeting last Sunday night, and I showed how this price has gone up, and this price, and some of these things, and some things have gone down, but most of the, most of the time in our, in our budgets, prices go up, they don't go down. Gas goes up, it doesn't go down. But here I'm going to tell you that God always meets the need. Always. The Bible says that they, they had all these people together, and like, man, we want to do something for God, and God says, go ahead and do it, and I'll take care of the bill. When you step out on faith and you follow God, God meets the need. I believe that no matter what vision that God gives us, if it, it's a vision, vision that comes from God, God will open the door and God will make our way straight to open that door. 
God will make it happen. God will provide the way. God will make it happen because the Bible says that every one of them met each other's needs through the provision of God. I, I just, I guess I was preaching and preaching and preaching and then I got to the end of it and I said, you know what? I, I read that and I thought, man, God is good. It's not just a matter of, hey, you should be giving. Don't ever forget, give and it shall be given unto you. I'm not going to just say, hey, you should be serving. God says, you serve, and I'm going to hook you up with my grace. All of these things that God says that I am good, my goodness, it, there's no end to my goodness, and I never am lacking on my needs when God is in control. Let me close with this. I don't know how much time we have left. We had a, a, a beam of board meeting and, uh, for the mission board that is across the street. And one of the preachers was sitting there and he raised his hand and he said, guys, I don't know how much time we have left. And, and I'm just saying that in all sincerity. I don't know how much time we have left. And, and I know that this world is like crumbling around us with, with suffering and, and all this garbage just breaks my heart. Every time I, I watch the news and things that are happening, and, and I, I was telling some of the group yesterday how... Planned Parenting is now fighting the bill to be able to kill kids if, they, if they're born. I don't, I don't know if you guys have heard this. If, if a baby is born and the baby is still alive and they messed up the abortion, they are now fighting to be able to give the doctors rights to kill the baby in the next room, to be able to go into the next room. It's just, it's just sick and twisted. And all this stuff that is going on around us, I, I don't want to focus on the negative. I want to realize that God has given me the ability and the power to change it. And I don't know how much time that I have left. And that's where Brother John Marine raised his hand. And he said, man, guys, I don't know how much time we have left. But I'm going to embrace God's blessing. I'm going to keep charging forward. And I want to make a difference with all the power that God's given us. I want to give it all we've got. And, and I, I'm telling you, I, 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 don't, I make a big deal out of Easter every year. But I just feel like this year, I want to feel God put his hands on our church and shake it. And I'm not physically saying shake the chandeliers in the buildings. I'm talking about the presence of God. I'm talking about seeing people that sit there and as the music is sung and people are sitting there hearing the word of God, that God shakes them. I'm talking about that apathetic child that you might have that you've invited a thousand times and he sits there like he's in a, in a daze. And, and I've heard this so many times that I've heard this all my life. And God sits down and God shakes him there on that spot. Yeah. I'm talking about when we get an invitation going and we're singing to God and you think that there's nothing that we can do and no words can reach into the heart of that God. God says, hey, here, when I'm showing up in that day, I can shake them up yeah. and help them see their need. I, I want to see an outpouring of grace. I want to see God work. But the Bible says that when they had their belief and they had their boldness and they had their faith and they gathered together and the Bible says that they knelt down and they prayed on that day and they praised God. I'm going to praise God in advance for what he's going to do on April 20th and Easter Sunday. I know it's out of the box, guys, to have a 9 o'clock and 11 o'clock service. It's it's. We don't have 9 o'clock services normally. We're doing everything different. But man, I believe that God's going to do something with this. And I want you guys to go out of your way to believe that God is in this. By taking cards. And stepping out of your comfort zone. And inviting every person that you can find. And inviting them to do this. Follow up. Pick them up. Take them out to lunch. Buy them an Easter basket. I don't care what you have to do. Get them here. I just know that God... He's given us so many warnings to say, here's my grace, I'm going to give you time. Here's my grace. And we have child, children, we have family members, we have all those that need Jesus Christ. But when we come together, I believe there's a great unity that God can bless. We're, we're, whatever you do, I'm asking you to serve in one service and then sit in the other one. I know we're going to have guests. I don't want them serving and sitting. They're just coming to, uh, to be able to sit in the service. But I want, I'm asking us. Sign up to do something that day so that other people can tag team with you to be able to serve and sit in a service and enjoy the blessings of God. And then also on that day, decide that you're going to bring one to be part of what God is doing.